Hello and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by Funkinsliff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I'm your host, Scott Dr. Jake Skolfein, musicologist and author of Everything is on the One, the First Guide of Funk. If you don't have your copy, get on over to Amazon and pick one up. You'll be so glad you did. Whether you're watching the video version of this at Funkinstuff.net or on YouTube or listening to the audio-only podcast version from providers like iTunes and Spotify, as always, I thank you so much for your continued interest and support in the show. Speaking of which, if you haven't already done so, subscribe to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube. That's where Truth and Rhythm lives. All kinds of goodies you'll get uh, early premieres, and it's all free, so make sure you sign up. Tell a friend. Tell family. Also, get your official Truth and Rhythm and Funk and Stuff gear at the FunkinStuff.net store. Cool stuff like I'm wearing right here. Truth and Rhythm shirts. Show your support and love of the show and also the musicians and the music that they represent. I um, also want to give a shout out to the Funk Exhibition Center and Hall of Fame in Dayton, Ohio, of which I'm very proud to be an official Funk Ambassador. Go to thefunkcenter.org to learn more and keep the funk alive. And now, with all that, it's time to get on with the show. Enjoy. I am pleased to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership keyboardist, composer, producer, Wayne Vaughn. Happy to be here. <laughs> Glad to have you here. I got to say a little bit more about you than that, though, Wayne. You... Oh, okay, fine. Yeah, yeah. Because during his, uh, your more than 40 years as a professional musician, you've recorded, performed, and composed for the Brothers Johnson, Earth, Wind, and Fire, Patti LaBelle, Aretha Franklin, Stevie Wonder, Brian McKnight, Kanye West, and The Emotions, the latter of which he met his longtime wife, Wanda Hutchinson, who was an absolute delight as a recent guest on the Truth and Rhythm show. One of Vaughn's most famous creations was the ultra-infectious 1981 pop-funk song, Let's Groove, which was one of Earth, Wind & Fire's biggest crossover hits. Wayne, glad to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Glad to be here. So, you know, as we're doing this, of course, we were talking before we came on air. We're sort of in a lockdown. I'm in uh, North Carolina. You're in California. By the time people see this, hopefully the lockdowns will be over. It'll be in a few weeks. Uh, but for yeah. right now, it's been uh, quite interesting, to say the least. We're living in the moment. And hopefully, by the time this airs, everyone will go, what lockdown? <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope so. Back to life uh, as somewhat normal again. Yes, somewhat. I don't know if it's going to change it forever the way we used to. The two is going to be the transition. But I tell you, let's just keep going and find out what it has in store, you know? Yeah. So you're uh, in the Los Angeles area, correct? Yes. I'm in today, I'm in Glendale, California at my house. And, um, we were upstairs trying to get the camera together, so that was the outdoor view. Now I'm in the Dungeon East, where we record the live stuff, and the Brains is in the uh, Dungeon West. So I'm just down here, and I'll be down here after we finish today. Just, you know, I, I'm using this opportunity um, to be creative and, you know, keep your mind clear and just let it flow, let it flow. Yeah, you got to roll with it, man. No other choice. No, no other choice. And you might as well take advantage. We've been delivered a bunch of lemons. And I just bought up a lot of organic sugar and got ice cubes, got some water. So I'm going to make the best lemonade possibly to be made. And then I will just, you know, a little lemonade, a little work, a little lemonade, a little work. Keep it moving. Sounds like a plan, Wayne, for sure. <laughs> 
Um, so you ready to uh, test those memory banks and uh, talk a little music history? And... No, have mercy. <laughs> well, I'm sure that by the intro, you said more than I remember. So, you know, <laughs> we'll take it from there, man. But uh, uh, I see you've done some homework, Scott. So enlighten me. <laughs> well, hopefully this won't be too hard. Um <laughs> Now I know that you uh, you uh, went to school uh, related to music, I believe, and so forth. So how did you? I think you started out playing flute and then moved to keyboards. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got down a musical path? Well, yes, the um, third grade was a transition. It was a transition for me in my life. I started playing flute, and it was like one of my favorite instruments. And I thought I would play flute for the rest of my life. And then we had a mishap on campus at my school, and our music teacher was no longer there. And it was a few years afterwards, got in the sixth grade, and there was a teacher that, you know, he loved music, so he would teach his students some little songs on the recorder. And we would all buy our little recorder, so I, that was my next opportunity. And then after that, 13 years old, my mom, you know, she bought us a piano and my sister and I started taking piano lessons and baby sister came, so she became like, oh, I want to take care of my baby sister. I said, well, I guess I'll keep playing and grooving. And then, you know, speaking of grooving, that song Young Rascals came out with grooving on a Sunday afternoon and then Walk On By and then I started hearing these Herbie Hancock songs and you know, this more, and then my brother started bringing jazz records. So it was the transition was playing, you know, traditional like gospel hymns, and then going into pop music, and then he brought Yusef Latif, Live at Pips, and John Coltrane, Africa Brass, and those two records sent me to, oh wow, what's this? So. Kept playing music, and then ninth grade, you know, talent show. So you get your first taste of playing for an audience. That was real, really the first time, ninth grade, and it was great. So I was like, oh man, this is fun. But I still wasn't like considering going to, you know, considering going to be a musician until I became um, around sixteen. And sixteen did it when he had a class called guidance and driver's education. Those were the two splits. So you learn how to drive a car and guidance was, what do you want to be when you grow up? So I was good in math, I was good in science, and I was okay in music, but I loved music more than math and science. So, and I loved math and science, but music just had a, another kind of charge so I decided at that age I'd be, you know, pursue music and then I started trying to learn everything I could about music. And some of my LA boys here, one of my teachers told us, if you keep doing music like that, you're gonna go crazy. Cause we were just, everything came out of our mouths was music. I mean, if you didn't mention or talk about music, you didn't have a conversation with us. So I really, really immersed myself into the music. And then, you know, from uh, learning some harmony and stuff in high school, then went to college and really learned at LACC, and then left LACC and went to UCLA, where I finished up with a music composition major. And and then that Friday. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, and you were born in Los Angeles? Yes. Uh -huh. Born and raised. South Central LA was, you know, there was a lot of LA musicians that I grew up with, you know. Charles Mims, who produced a lot of those Patrice Russian albums, and, uh, and of course Patrice herself, and then a lot of my boys, a lot of my, everybody that was around us, the kids became um, famous in their own right, like Ricky Washington was in our class, Ronald Bruner Jr., well he was, you know, Ronald, Ronald, Ronald Bruner Sr., his babies, Steven and Ronald became Thundercat and Ronald Bruner Jr., the bass player drummer, respectively. And then 
Ricky's son is Kamasi Washington, who became this great jazz tenor saxophonist. But all of these guys are also from L.A. So L.A. had just, you know, and Dugu Chancellor, Reggie Andrews, and a lot of different artists of that nature was just, we were like five, ten block radius at least. So it was, music was flowing all around the hood in those days. Larry Nash, when I would build with it, Raymond Pound, Stevie Wonder, Michael Stanton, Marvin Gaye, and then, you know, we're just like so many different themes of to be in an environment like that. It inspired me to really try to hang in there as much as possible because all of these cats were better than I was. <laughs> I mean, you know, I was like, but I hung around the baddest cats. So some of that rubbed off. And when I left UCLA on a Friday, Charles Mims had hooked it up to where I got the Brothers Johnson gig. And I wasn't about to graduate. I got out of school like maybe four and a half weeks, almost five weeks early on a quarter system at UCLA, which is basically going to school five weeks and graduating after, you know, all the stuff. So talked to all my professors. I said, man, I got a gig with Quincy and da 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 I was doing great in some classes. Those were the classes that would go, oh, man, I don't know if I can let you go. And the classes I was, like, not doing good in, and the guy said, Dr. Stevenson at UCLA, he said, oh, you're going to perform? I said, yeah, Doc, I'm going to perform. He said, what grade do you need? <laughs> so I got out, so I left on a Friday, Saturday. I was in... Um, University of Maryland, Parliament Funkadelic, Bootsy, Hamilton Bohannon, and Natalie Cole, Brothers Johnson gig. So I left from playing with my band, which I had a band called Daybreak, going through UCLA. And that band, everybody got drafted to go on a road with other musicians, like the big guys. So that band was like a MBA from college, MBA kind of thing. But I was mimicking Earth, One and Fire back then. You know, that was my thing. Our band, I didn't believe in like singing groups. I believed more in instrumental groups like Miles, Herbie, and all that type of stuff. So when I heard Earth, One and Fire for the first time, I was like, wait a minute. These cats are playing music. They're musicians and singing like that? Wait a minute. So it just, changed the whole dynamic in my approach to music. Sly and Earth, Wind and Fire were two big things. And James Brown was performing all around where I grew up at the 5-4 ballroom. Tina Turner, all these, Ike and Tina Turner, all the cats were playing over there, which is literally, my hikes are longer than the walk to there from my house where I grew up. But since I was so much into jazz, I couldn't see the funk side, the R&B side, until later. And then after I uh, got my Fender Rose electric piano, that changed stuff, you know. Mercy, 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 cannonball. I didn't understand, but that was so much funk and blues and stuff and that. So I started gravitating to that, and that's where the funk in my life came from. Well, um, I don't know if you're aware, but you know I'm also from Los Angeles, so um, I went. Oh. Yeah, and I went to UCLA for a while in the early '80s as a kinesiology major, if you can believe that. <laughs> That's what I told my daughter to major kinesiology. I, I believe it, so you go with Poly Pavilion. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I remember I saw, the I remember the kinesiology department over there. <laughs> I I saw the Commodores play Poly Pavilion in like '78 or something like that. Wait a minute. I was there. At that show? I had my son on my neck, carrying, he was two years old, and that was right after Johnny Wilder had the accident. He was a quadriplegic. As a, one of the last times I seen Johnny in the world when we had been on the road, and that year, because we were on the road with the Commodores in 77, 78. A lot, Graham Central Station and Commodores and then Heat Waves. 
After the emotion tour that year in 78, he waved open for the Brothers Johnson, which was, you know, I think that was their first time coming to L.A. or coming to the States, period. And they were a reckoning. Boy, they were so, I mean, pound for pound, the group was like, you know, the groups like we knew in the, in the hood. They were a good band, but individually, maybe the musicians weren't as bad as, you know, the the musician like we hung around with. But as the unit, as a unit, as that band, they were so tight. The Commodores? No, um, I'm talking about uh, Heat Wave. Heat Wave, yeah. yeah. I, saw, I, oh. say, I say Heat Wave at the Santa Monica Civic. Oh, yeah. No, Heat Wave was amazing. That's why you reminded me of Johnny. I know I'm going all over the place, but you reminded me of Johnny that night at the uh, at the concert that, I was so we were at the same place. Who would have thought that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Nineteen seventy-eight. If yeah, if you were in LA, I mean, our paths might have crossed other times than that because I went to hundreds of shows. So, well, uh, if you ever went to see Grand Central Station at the Roxy, that was still to this day one of the unbelievably energetic, super crazy shows. I've ever witnessed, and I saw Graham with Sly, and you might have went to the forum, and I think it was 72. No, that was, that was like the first concert that I ever went to, besides going to Shelly's Manhole and the Lighthouse. I went to see Sly in a group that I never heard of, open for him, named Tower of Power. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and it wasn't until they got to she really wants to go, you know, that oh, tune. Yeah. And I said, guess that man, wait a minute. <laughs> oh, man, they were, what a show. So, I, man, what I went through to learn some of this stuff and the bands that I saw, and, you know, the, the bands that I didn't see, like didn't see James Brown, didn't see Hendrix. Oh, I, mean, I could have seen Hendrix so many times. But, I was into jazz, and the other guys on my block that were getting a little more psychedelic with the black lights, they were all into Hendrix. So it was two different factions. They're walking down the street playing Hendrix, and I'm walking down the street playing Bobby Hutchinson. So, you know. But it was, we all got along. We all were cool, and I learned a little bit. But I'm at the Hollywood Farmer's Market Sunday, and some music was playing, and I wasn't listening to it. And the guitar player did something, and I, I went, I said, is that Hendrix? See, that sounds like Hendrix. And I know a little bit about what Hendrix sound like from the little bit of knowledge that I have on him. But I knew enough to knew that was Hendrix. It's like knowing that's Miles or that's Freddie or something like that. And the guy went and looked on the phone. He said, oh, that's Hendrix. And it was some obscure Hendrix tune. It was just he was in the middle of his solo. And I said, that's either Hendrix or somebody biting like a mofo. <laughs> so that was Hendrix, man. But we had so much music, as you know, in L.A. When, when did you leave L.A.? Oh, I left in, uh, I was there until 2005. Yeah, I, I went. Oh, my God. I saw so many great shows at the Roxy. I didn't see Graham, but I saw Herbie and George Duke and Rufus and the Ohio Players and Brass Construction <laughs> and on and on and on. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I remember, well, too late, but the Brecker Brothers one year, man, I went crazy. They were, and, and Michael was playing with the wah-wah pedal. First time I heard the saxophone playing with a wah-wah, mm -hmm. and then he had all that energy. Great. <laughs> I'm, I'm about to say great Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 2005, man. So you you were born and raised here as well. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. You were native. 2005. You haven't been gone at all. That's so It's it's it runs deep in my veins. Um. But um. And your but your, your father played some blues guitar too, right? My dad played blues guitar. He played a little piano, and he loved music. His dad was a juke joint guitarist blues guitars and that's where he picked it up from but he was you know totally just playing by ear and just playing around with it and he would play these songs and when he passed 
and a John Lee Hooker record came on. And I listened and I, I went, that's the way my dad sang. I mean, it was a trip. I was like, I said, wow, that's how Papa sound. He was, how he plays and how he bends the notes. And on this jazz, well, not a jazz, I don't know what it's called, but the CD that we did in 95 that it was, took me one year to record called Three Generations of Groove. And I put it out and pulled it back. It was too hard to do it on your own. Now I could re-release it or something, but I have him on a tune called Can You Tell Me? And one day I was in the studio and the track was playing. It was two different keys. So, but when the tune went into E, it, he was just sitting there just playing the same groove over the, tr over the track. But when he went to the E groove, which was the key he was playing, I said, oh, my God, that's, I went and he kept playing. I went and hooked up the mics and everything and put it on him, and he didn't know. I put some headphones on him, and... I recorded him, so that's the only recording I have of him hmm. on this particular tune. But if I would have known what I knew as he was going out, you know, I would have, re you know, how he should have, would have, could have. But I would have recorded that guy. He was, he was bottom land. It was like you, you can't describe it. It's like I wouldn't, you know. He would have to fit in where he'd get in kind of thing. But if he would get in that slot, it was like he would wear the groove off. Matter of fact, I have his guitar in my studio now, my original studio. And his fingers, like one finger was like this big to mine. He had the biggest hands ever. His fret, his fret, <laughs> fret. His fretboard is worn out from the acid on his finger, the wood to the fret, like, the fret is sticking out that much now from him just sat there playing the blues and then he'll come in the studio. Hey, wait, I need my guitar tuned up. Oh, okay, Dad. I'm in the middle of whatever. But well, it wasn't good. If you're like me, it wasn't until um, later on that I started really appreciating the blues, you know, when I got older. But, yeah. Yeah, it was like it was always there for me. He loved it. And my uncles loved it. They would always say when I would attempt to play blues, they would always say, ah, well, put me in the alley. Put me in the alley. Because they knew. They did all the Central Avenue jazz and blues clubs back in the, you know, mid-40s, early 50s. He would tell me about seeing Duke and Count Basie and them. And his sister had one of the... Um, House on 47th Street. She had one of those houses, the big house, if you know those houses, like west of Central Avenue on 47th, like between Wadsworth and McKinley and all that. Those were the houses that she would house the musicians, the, man, I can't speak today, the musicians in, because they could stay in a hotel then, and the first hotel they could stay in was the Dunbar, you know, on Central Avenue, which is still there. It's like a historical landmark now but that's where all the cats had to stay when they come so they stayed at her place hmm. and i had a lot of stories about that we supposed to wrote a play about house on 47th street and all that was so much yeah i wanted to ask you so when you were coming up and and playing the keys i think you mentioned herbie hancock but who are some of your other big influences specifically on keyboard uh herbie hancock Ahmad Jamal, Joe Zabinu, um, then you get into the McCoy Tyners and the Keith Jarrett's, you know, I would listen to and admire and try to, you know, decipher. Then when it got into like the Ramsey Lewis's and the, uh, the feel good pianists, you know, Les McCann. I tried to get a little bit from everybody. Herbie was more of the um, greatest because from him, I tried to pattern my harmonic concept afterwards. I like to hear Lush 
nice harmonic progressions. And I always shy. Maybe that's why sometimes, like, the blues or the reggae or some of that stuff, I would, I could appreciate it get into, but for me, when I go and approach music, I wouldn't do it because the harmonic structure sometimes was a little bit too straight for me. But then as I got into more popular music, then I was able to appreciate the simplicity of playing simple, because everything that I would do, it would be more or less, uh, it doesn't, if, it, if it's not challenging, the music has to challenge me, sort of thing. So, when I got into the more popular music, I just tried to let the funk take me. Because funk in itself is simple, but in depth, it's complex. So there's many layers to the funk or to the blues or to anything that we would as jazz musicians say, ah, that's easy, ah, I can figure that out. See, we would go to some of these tunes we would listen to. No one had transcri uh, transcribed some of these um, songs our dolphin dance, for instance, you know, we just sit back and transcribe that ourselves. And that's what we learned when we were in school, you know, musicianship, harmony, they would teach you how to use your ear and theorize. So theory would have it. If I could figure out the baseline, you got major, minor, diminished, augmented, you got a nine, you got a flat nine, you got a raise, something, blah, blah, blah then you can kind of figure it out. It was, it's only 12 notes, so it is. But sometimes these guys would color the, the harmonic situation so hip. I mean, I would be, rewind, uh, and we didn't have the thing that we can take it and slow it down or slow it and listen to it. You listen to that regular tempo, trying to transcribe it and listen and do it and, but it, it worked, and it, it helped me out a, in a lot. So I was able to use some of that stuff. One time I told Herbie, he had a tune called I Have a Dream on the Prisoner album. So the first chord of that song, I love that chord. It was like a D minor 11 with a 9 or something like that. And that's the first song, first chord in Let's Groove a half step higher. <laughs> One day I told Herbie that. I said, oh, man, you remember I have a dream? I took the cord and did this. And Herbie was, oh, oh. And he went, oh? Huh? <laughs> I was talking so fast, he didn't hear what I said. And, of course, he heard that tune many, many times now. But E minor 9 with some kind of 11 or 4, I don't even know it's a voicing, but it was a Herbie chord. So my chord progression, even if it's funk, has always been more complex. Phil Upchurch would tell me, oh, we would do some of those tunes, he would go, well, man, I'm just going to wait till you write a song, and then I'm going to come back and do it instrumentally, because your chords are all jazz. <laughs> you know, but Phil, and I just ran into him at the NAMM show. You, did you ever go to one of the NAMM shows? You know, I have not, but uh, I watch all the video clips, and um, I had Larry Dunn on one time, and he told me, you know, that I could come out there as his guest to go, and I was Oh, man, to, yeah, you know, man, you would go nuts. Larry, oh, my God, Larry, is such, and he has the, the Moog endorsement, so he's out there. I see him all the time out there playing the mini moves and stuff, you know, all the only Larry can do, but the NAMM show... I was just, and that's why I run into most people. I don't see folks for a whole year, but at least once a year, I know I'll run into everybody and say, hey, you know, catch up. It's like the best party there is. Yeah, I got to get out to it. Um, <clears throat> tell me more about Game with the Brothers Johnson. What was it you think that kind of cinched getting that gig for you? Boy, what a long story. See, this is, I'm, you, you, you are asking questions that are a few known facts. So like I said, my buddy Charles Mims was doing um, arrangements for Quincy. 
and he was rehearsing the band for Quincy to go out on that 1976 tour. And I'm in school. I'm not thinking about going on. I had missed like three or four gigs with different people. And it was all because I was in school. And I kept saying, now, I got to finish before I go on the road. I got to finish. I, I put all this time in. I got to at least get my BA. So I had a son in 76. And right as I was getting ready to, to have this son, and Charles knew I wasn't going to leave school, but he said, man, but you're going to have to get another job now because you got this, you got this, you got a son now. You got to go to work. And I got a gig for you with the Brothers Johnson because their keyboard player, there was two keyboard players. One of the keyboard players was Nat Adderley's son, Nat Adderley Jr. And they had a gig. He missed the gig some kind of way. So they let him go because he missed the gig. You know, that's the cardinal sin on the road. If you miss a show, that's it. So he, he ended up going doing all those Luther Vandross records. So he, he, he did very well for himself. But because of Nat missing a show, because Charles Mims was in with Quincy, I did an audition. Quincy had to take one of my tapes from my band, Daybreak, listen to me playing clavinet and Fender Rhodes. And just from that tape and Charles saying, hey, man, he can do the gig blah, 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 Quincy just said, okay, he's hired. <laughs> so they gave me the music. Well, no, they gave me the record. I had to transcribe the music, learn my parts, and by the time I graduated, which I had like about a week and a half to prepare, I left on a Friday and Saturday. I was on the road. So I went straight from UCLA to the to the funk. So that was my that was my next schooling because then hanging around Lewis and George, and then hanging around Bootsy and Parliament and Mudbone and Bernie Ro Bernie was he sound like Keith Jarrett on a piano harmonically. He would play some of the craziest stuff. So we would talk about all kind of stuff. That's how I met Fred Wesley and Maceo and, you know, here I am on the road 23. And on our tour, George and I were the two oldest in the band. Everyone else was 19 to 22 or 21. So I'm the senior member beside George. He's like all of three weeks older than me or two weeks older than me. Hey, and, Wayne, Wayne, just to set the... Um the mood and, and time frame for listeners and viewers. Um, that was 76. So the lookout for number one album had been a big yes. hit. And did that they was have, the beginning of the big hit. Did they have the second album out yet or not yet? No. Okay. Look out for number one. When I left town, couldn't get arrested on the radio. It wasn't played. You know how you break records. So they had broke the record on the East coast and the South. West Coast, as everything, gets everything last. Fashion, it trends. The West Coast gets everything the last. That's the way it comes from Europe, goes to New York, comes. So anyway, when I left, literally three people knew who the Brothers Johnson were. In six weeks when I came back, everyone knew. Six weeks. I'll be good to your hit. Uh, I'll be good to you, uh, Smash. And of course, my favorite record because I'm new and getting into this funk was "Get the Funk Out My Face." You know yeah. that was just like, my goodness. And they would have their radio, you know, the big radios, the AKA Ghetto Blasters, but the ones that you had a quarter inch input into, they were making them like that then. So when we would be in the dressing room. Lewis would plug his bass into one of those radios and just kill it. Just, I mean, and, and plus, this is where I learned how to write more music, too, because we would get into tracks 
more. Like, if a track was funky, forget the lyrics and all of that. Q, on the other hand, taught me it's all about the melody. You can make the track funky on anything. It's about the melody. Then I come to realize I would hear the funkiest tracks, baddest tracks you could ever hear. But then when I hear the melody and the hooks and all that stuff put on top of it, I wouldn't like it as much mm -hmm. because it started topsy-turvy. It's harder to make a track a hit than it is to make a melody a hit. You have a melody? So that's a whole other story as we go down this, this storyline. But look out for number one, get the funk out of my face. That was such a big record. And time for the Brothers Johnson. They could do no wrong. They opened up <laughs> in that year. So, okay, so that was in May. So we went through the year, through December, touring back and forth. We went out sometime that summer with, with Quincy and played all of Quincy's music. And then in between the show, Brother Johnson would do their thing. And then he had this group called the Watch Line Singers. That's where I met Martinette Jenkins and all these bad vocalist and he had dancers you know q had a big production i don't that, know if you that saw like, that show that was like the body heat or stuff like that yeah. era stuff like that yeah stuff like that it was 1976 after simpson had wrote that one song for him and um q was out there so we did a, a nice long tour with that just a u.s tour but uh, um then we went back on the road, and of the road that year would have been my first time almost, but twice, almost meeting Wanda. Because the emotions was on a thing with us called Take It Easy Ranch. It was the modern day of that era, Woodstock, 1976, in Maryland at some place when we were getting there. So it would be something like Burning Man today or something like that, between Woodstock and Burning Man. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people there. One road to get in and get out. They had to bring everything in. And two people had died in the lake before we got there. I mean, it was like one of those crazy spots. And Wanda's sister, Sheila, was at the mixing console. It was the only gig that the brothers did without uniforms on. We all played with no shirts. It was 100 degrees and humidity, 110, out there. Craziest gig ever, and the emotions were there. And then later that year is when Earth, Wind & Fire was doing the Pyramid Tour. Des Moines, Iowa, and Omaha, Nebraska. Brothers Johnson, they so you know Maurice. I can hear Reese now. Oh man, we can sell some. We'll get the Brothers Johnson to open up. So the first night was emotions. Brothers Johnson, Earth, Wind, and Fire. But Earth, Wind. I think it was Getaway they had out right then. So they were killing. You know, the, the band was killing everything. But this is where I learned about new groups coming out with people never seen before and they have a one or two hits. Earth Wind had several hits and Emotions had hits, but I think this was right before, it was before Best of My Love though. Best of My Love wasn't out yet. So Brother Johnson come on, people going crazy, never heard them, and then when Get the Funk Out My Face, the crowd was standing in their seats and you know, we are just on the apron of the stage. We don't have no stage, nothing. It's just the hardly any lights. Only had super troopers because it was our Earth Wind stage and all of the lights they had behind us. So we were just using super troopers in that, but the crowd went so crazy. The next night, oh, so after we finished that night, Earth Wind took their time coming out because it was as they would say back with the Parliament Funkadelic days, too much pee-pee, poo-poo on the stage. Yeah. They would just leave, you know, it would be all over the stage, too funky. 
and that's what happened that night. So Earth, Wind, Wade, and, you know, every day we watched the show, they were, you know, killing me. I loved it, but I wasn't thinking of it like competition. This is when I was learning about the competition of the bands and the music and show business and how you got to one-up and this. Eh, just go out and play with you. Do. I don't do that. Yeah. yeah, oh, my God. But anyway, the next night, Brothers Johnson went first. Then the emotion, then Earth wins. And afterwards, we get word back that Maurice had said, they will never be on another show of ours ever again. <laughs> and it wasn't because he didn't like them or nothing like that. It was nothing to do with none of that. It was about the business of show business. When you put a show together, you want to build it to where no one out does. I've seen cats come and do top 40 and blow away um, a headliner. They think the headliner got a big name but only have two hits. And then the the warm-up band plays top 20. Say they go through Rock With You, uh, Rick James, uh, Ohio Player. They just start playing hit after hit after hit. And everybody, you know, they're getting warmed up. So they're like, yeah, yeah. And then the band that you come to see comes on. First, they got to get through some of their, well, this is not a hit, but it's a nice song, you know. And... I've seen people get blown out the water. Then they, then, then when the audience get tired, what do they do? They leave. And oh, that's like playing, why a lot of the bands I play would, play um, music that's not that great over the PA too before they come out. Oh yeah, oh yeah. You got to have it set. It's a science. It's a science to that. And I learned so. I learned so much about that in just that first year, 1976. So that was my master's, you know, from my BA. So I took a one year course, crash course in mastering with Q and all that. And Q was brilliant. I seen a lot of things and we hung for those years. And actually that was my first record I ever put out was with Quincy. And it got the first record I ever did, got nominated for a Grammy. It was on a platinum record. I mean, all first time kind of things, which is, you know, that doesn't happen. Was was Blam the first one you were on, or were you on a record before Blam? I was just on Blam. That was Blam. And the tune Street Waves, that was up against Earth, One and Fire, hmm. who Earth, One and Fire won the Grammy that year, right? But it was the fact that all of these little things kept going around. I saw Sheila in 76. Then I, Wanda was on the, that show. I didn't never meet them that night or anything. But uh, um, it was so close-knit. And then when we um, did all get together, like in 78, then I had matured a whole nother level hanging with Q, seeing what to do, what not to do. And then I got to meet Wanda, and then we threatened every, you know, after we met each other, I mean, had to know each other a little bit, we threatened on writing together. But by that time, I was done with the road. I was praying to come off the road. I had learned what I needed to know, and I saw that being a musician on the road necessarily wasn't the best place for a musician to be. If you were at home writing and producing and honing your craft, that would be more lucrative for me anyway for that time because I didn't want to be an artist. I didn't want to, I didn't, that wasn't into my thing, you know, going out being a star. I didn't want that because I saw what happened to Lewis and George, especially George. He couldn't go anywhere because he was too well recognized. When you, hey, I told him, if I want to wish anything on somebody, I wish fame on them. <laughs> that, that would be the one. I didn't say money. Just yeah, let me let you be famous. Boom, just drop it on them and just see how their world just. So that wasn't for me, but Wayne, when we did go out. Hmm? Sorry. 
Can you just take a, a, a moment to share what Lewis Johnson was like as a force of nature on the base? <laughs> well, Lewis Johnson, he was like my baby brother, you know, because he was an innocent soul, okay? He wasn't like, he was, the best way I can describe that boy is innocent, and whatever he put his mind to do, he was going to do it, okay? He was definitely incredible basis, and he would come over to my studio. It would just, he and I, Ricky Lawson, another bad drummer that was with the brothers when I got with them, he ended up starting a group. Uh, yellow jackets and um, we would be back in the back jam and different bass players a lot of musicians from those days would come around and look back there and they would try to understand what Lewis was doing because Lewis technique you could have two bass players play the same bass and Lewis is going to sound way different than the other bass player it was his approach to the instrument. I guess is where he put his hands to the pickups. It was so many different things of that nature by Lewis. But he was definitely a one of a kind. He was a natural. You could not teach a Lewis Johnson. You can definitely imitate a Lewis Johnson. But when we would go to Japan and stuff, they were... I mean, they had Elvis down, they had everybody down. And the first time we went to the second time, the cats started to get Lewis down. They didn't have him down because Lewis kept morphing. He wouldn't stay the Lewis from 78 to the Lewis in 1980. He was different. Well, especially from 76 to 80, he was different. And Lewis, you know, in his innocence, we would be out on the road and he would say, man, Quincy have all these bad bass players playing all these tracks. And then when I get home, we get off the road, Q would say, okay, Lewis, I have some songs. You got to play on these tones. And he said, and Q would erase all of these bass players because, number one, Q would have Lewis by himself. Lewis come in, do the thing. Lewis learn the song. And then Lewis puts Lewis on there, which is the part you can't write on the page. You can't write the, 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 the interpretation of the musician. You can get close of documenting something that you want and you know what you want, like any arranger. But when you get a musician like a Lewis and you get him to know the fundamentals of the song, then you say, okay, Lou, go for it. And you hear on all those Michael Jackson records, if that's any indication, because some of those records he just heard and came in, unlike when he's on his own records and he's doing what he does. And listen at how he lays those grooves and sounds sometimes even differently than he sounds on the Brother Johnson records. But he could do whatever he wanted to do when he wanted to do it. Plus, he could play drums, and he was stupidly bad on guitar. Hmm. Okay, he, and who did he sound like? Hendrix. <laughs> Another one, you know, but he was just a, a, a gifted musician, and I talked to him before, his, before he left us, and I was trying to get him over, just like so many, like his cousin, Alex Ware. Alex ended up leaving the brothers and going with Talking Heads and Tom Tom Club and all that. So that, oh, that's Alex. Oh, that, but, when I, yeah, but when I heard that, I knew it. He had a rhythm guitar that was, I haven't met, not a cat. He is a unique, and you know, we got, you know, Al McKay, Marlo Henderson, and Roland Batista. Roland and Marlo were my two favorite, what I would call double guitars back in the, like the, the end of the 70s. 
man, those are my two favorites of all time. But Lewis himself, man, he could fit into any situation that required being on the other side of that. And Quincy, Quincy knew that. He spotted it, and that's how he used it. That's why Lewis is on so many of those records that you heard Quincy produce back in those days, especially not even including like some of the George Benson and all that. I mean, he did more records than I had realized he was, he was on. That's how much, and we would just be playing video games and stuff because he was a serious arcade man, right? So they had the Fox Field Mall, which is down where you know, and he lived right there in Ladera. Mm-hmm. So we would go and we would hang out. He would say, Dwayne, huh. let's go to the arcade. And I loved the arcade back then. Some kind of way is like candy. I grew out of the arcade stuff. I don't know. But I guess I might pick it back up because I know when that one um, game, I don't know if you ever tried to play it, called Halo. Halo, yeah. Sort of like a war game. It. Yeah. My son, as a young kid, he played Halo with me, and I couldn't, that was the only game I couldn't figure out. <laughs> so from that time, I really couldn't figure out. But Lewis could figure out all those games, and we're over there playing when they had the submarine game, Sea Wolf, that was one of my, I thought I was doing something, man. And what's the one with all the Galaxian and all of those? We'll play double teams on that, so. Yeah. What can I say, man? Lewis was an exceptional, creative, I don't know, I can't say underrated, but in terms of the musicians that, you know, we, we look at a lot of different, bases out there we i have a lot of my favorites but in terms of funk or i mean i've had lewis play some jazz though because he loved jazz too he wanted to get into that a hey, that's how they tune streetway we were over at my at my studio the the, the song that jerry hay had that jerry hay had put the, the trumpets on that was my section we had been playing that on the road all that year, 77 years. I had written that, we played it. And Lewis knew it. So when we got to my house one day, Lewis said, Wayne, I want to play some jazz. And he started going, do, 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 do. I said, boo, I like that. Keep playing, keep playing. Then I went over to the Fender Road and they started playing that little thing. And that's all we had. So we took that section. It took my two sections, and we put them all together. And that's how the beginning of that song, then we had Ricky come over, and we all played it together. We put it on tape. Q heard the tape. And we were looking for another instrumental that year. Q was trying to change it around. Oh, what about this? What about that? And I was like, it is what it is. I mean, it, it feels good. And he came to the thing. After we changed it around, he went back and said, all right, put it back like it was. And then we had Harvey Mason, Lewis, George and Alex, and myself. And that was the, Quincy had us up all night long that night. We did a session all night. He recorded the Blam album, the tracks, in one night. All the the whole album in one night. We were getting ready to go on. We had to go on tour the next day or the two days afterwards, and he had to deliver this record. And I didn't understand what was happening. So he had David Foster and he had Harvey Mason. Well, I, no, Harvey brought David. He said, "I got a guy. You're gonna like him, David Foster, just in from Canada." And Harvey, and Harvey's the one that brought Sea Wind from Hawaii. So Harvey brought a lot of cats to town as well. But C. Wynn and David Foster, uh, Harvey had a lot to do with. And then they did the whole record in one night, and we got the street wave, and I did my little part, and the rest was history. Record went platinum without a real single. 
the Blam album was the only record out of those. It didn't have yeah. Ain't we, Ain't we Funkin' Now was like an R&B hit, the but they didn't have a crossover. Yeah. Uh uh-uh, uh uh uh. It wasn't a crossover, and that's what Q was going for. He was going for the crossover, so he had it with I'll Be Good to You. He had it with Strawberry. And Strawberry, I thought another song was stronger than Strawberry. And she was like, oh, no way. Oh, it's that melody, man. You know, that a do 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 He's singing out a little part. He's like, man, that's a hit. That's a hit. Sure enough. And then the next record afterwards is when I left the band and I came back was Stomp. The fourth record. And after that, Oh man, what a what a trip! And we only knew what we know. We only know so much. And um, the brothers felt like they wanted to go on their own and produce themselves, as opposed to Q. Because number one, Q made it look easy. That's the next thing. You can do something so well, you can make it look easy that everyone thinks they can do it. So, and everyone has a record in them. That's for sure. But to be of certain caliber, uh, Q said, wait a minute, what? They wanted to leave. So Q called me, and he was deeply, he was like hurt. Oh, man, those are like my little brothers. And, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, and it was a learning experience for me, and I was just trying to, come up with what Wanda and I were doing. We were just writing, and I think we had maybe, so that was 80, so maybe we was just doing Let's Groove, something of that nature. Maybe we're just after Let's Groove all this happened. So it was after the Blam album, which I guess came out in 80. I'm not sure. I think 80's right. And was 80? I'm pretty sure 80. 80, okay. So the next record the brothers produced on themselves and as Quincy would tell me, he would say, one guy would say, what does it take to make a great producer? And instead of listening, well, first you better get the melody right, and then you should do this, Quincy wrote a one line. He said, for that era, 25 years experience. <laughs> That's all he said. And I went, oh, yeah, you you got that right, Q, and the rest is history. So, you know, but those were the days, man. I wasn't those sure. I, days, I, I wasn't sure, uh, Wayne. I thought maybe uh, Quincy was didn't have as much time for them anymore because he was moving on to Michael Jackson and stuff like that. Unfortunately, and I'm not being the 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 only reason why I know this because I know Jordan Lewis very well, and they told me what they wanted to do. And at the time, Quincy and I were hanging because Quincy called me when I got married in 79. And then, uh, you know, so 80. So all that was in that era, 1980, 81. And I had left the brothers because Wanda and I started doing the Patty LaBelle and we did this and we were on the road. And at the end of that tour, the I said, ah, I can do this. So they went and hired two piano players, two keyboard players. And for some reason, whatever, it wasn't working out for them. They said, oh, man, Wayne could do this. He just won keyboard player. So they called me back. And, yeah, so it had to be 80, 81. This was all happening. So we hadn't moved into this house yet. And then <laughs> George say, do you know Stomp yet? Say, man, I got stuff. I got the strings in one hand. I got the rose in the other hand. And George say, oh, man. So their manager, the uh, the Fritz Gerald and Hardleys, they had Chicago and Rufus and them. They called, and we made a deal. That's how I went back on the road. We made a deal, and it was cool for me. And basically, I just said, I'll just be – a side man to where y'all can use me like I'm the crew or something or independent contractor. Don't pay me in salary because you got to write that off. Pay me in per diem. 
So they would just pay me in for them, and it would just be rolled off. So it was like, I don't even know if they had me listed as a musician anymore. So that was that was how I went back with the brothers. They had me like under the the the, the, the carpet, so to say. 